And as I've said before, when I go to different places and I speak, and I mean it with all my heart, if ever you have seen me do anything good, I promise you that's him. If ever you have seen me do anything bad, I promise you that's me. This morning, so I want to be clear. Seriously, if you get blessed from today, it's because it's him. If you don't get blessed from today, it's because of me. Now, but here's the thing. Did you know, listen, listen closely, Shavuot, is, any of the feast days, is not about us being blessed. It's about us blessing him. Amen. You should have, the, the roof should have shaken with that amen, but it didn't, so I'm going to let it go. We come thinking, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to be blessed here. No. We are not to come empty-handed. Amen. Now, I know today we cannot give the way we want back in the day, but we can still give of ourselves. Someone else say amen. I don't do that a lot, but remember, I'm past Pentecostal, okay? Let's do that okay? So, this morning I'm working on my little message, and I, I, I'm, what time is it? Well, I've been told I get 30 minutes. Okay, so it's, I got, okay, sure, right. You already said we're running your hand schedule. All right. We'll take it out of lunch. <laughs> okay, take it out of lunch. All right, it's 15 after, okay. This morning I'm going over my notes, I'm kind of reviewing things here and there, just praying, and and I get this phone call from a friend in Israel. And he's crying. I'm sorry. I told myself I was not going to cry. He says, Steve. I go, what? Hey, man, how are you doing? No, no, no. This is not about fun. I go, what's going on? He goes, you have no idea what's going on in Israel right now. I go, well, what's going on? He goes, I have been in the Knesset meetings. I've been with Netanyahu. He goes, I have been with all these big meetings. He goes, Steve, your message on the on the Noahide laws, you've nailed it. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I just watched your teaching on the Noahide laws. I'm right here in Israel. I've already been experiencing what you said. I go into these meetings with my seat seats, and all of the, the, uh, the, the Jews there are saying, what are you wearing those for? You've got the Noahide laws. The Noahide laws are for you. Those are for us. He said, I got to the point, it got so heated, I had to hide my zitzits. He said, see, you have no idea what's going on. He said, he's, <laughs> he starts crying. He said, see, things are happening much faster than people have any clue. He goes, I tell you the truth. He goes, us Hebrews who are trying to pursue, not us Hebrews, I don't want to have Hebrews for some people. Us Gentiles trying to pursue the Torah, we're the enemy. He said, you have no idea how they view us. He goes, the church over here, he goes, I'm in these meetings with all these church leaders, peer representatives, they're, they're throwing money left and right at the Jews and they have no idea how the Jews are going to take that money and turn it right against them. He said, in one of his meetings, and I, this is not my notes, forgive me, this is a came this morning from sharing it. He said, and when talking to one of the big people, he said, well, what do I need to do to be able to pursue Torah since I can't, I found that the Noahide's all in for me? He goes, you got to convert to Judaism. And he goes, okay. And the guy goes, well, now you're asking the right questions, the Jew said. And then starts laying out the things he has to do. Denying Yeshua is first and foremost on the list. Folks, listen to me. There's a reason why Revelation says that the enemy pursues those who obey the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. I understand we don't understand everything. I understand we don't understand. Um, but the thing is, and we talked, and I mean, I should say he talked, for a good 30 minutes. Just telling me all these things. And I can't even. I, I, he was talking so fast. I couldn't. I, I tried. I go, hold on, let me slow some things down. <laughs> just even know. He had given up. Um, he said, see, everything they're doing, it's looking good. He said, I'm telling you, it's going to be the system of the Antichrist. It's right here. 
He said they are preparing for the, 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 the United Nations being removed and everything being centered in Jerusalem. Everything, they're waiting for the day. This is, he said everything is set. They're waiting for the one event and boom, it starts. And they will take control. He says, and I wrote this down, he goes, it's unraveling much faster than anyone can imagine. He said, we, he goes, the news media is not giving us what has been going on behind the scenes. He says, Netanyahu's coming back in office. He goes, believe it or not, he goes, they're not telling you. He goes, I'm telling you, Netanyahu's going to have to get in, in office or going to be playing a massive major role. He says, I'm telling you, it's, it's all flowing much faster than they're not telling us. And then he made a statement. He says, see, the time of teachings are over. It's time for the warnings. That was his urgency. He says, I can't stop thinking. Because the second I was praying this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit just told me, I've got to tell you this. He says, the time of teachings is done. He says, we've got to start warning people because it's going to happen when it happens. It's, it's, it's already in, in motion. It's like everything's just ready to go. It's turn the ignition, and it's, the engine is running at 100 miles per hour. That's where it's at. He said, something will happen suddenly. He goes, I don't even know what it is. He goes, but when it does, Israel will rise to center stage. You watch. He goes, and then he was in the meeting with, he had with Netanyahu, and they were all discussing. And he said, Steve, my jaw hit the floor. He goes, I used to think, you know, Israel was like probably, you know, top three or four or five of military. He goes, Steve, they got technology that's blowing me out the water. He goes, I've never dreamed that I could see what I'm seeing. He goes, their technology is going to wipe everybody off and they're going to be dominant. He goes, no one's even thinking that they're going to be the, the center stage, but it's going to happen. You watch. Anyway, I felt I needed to share that. And, I, and that's, uh, he talked, like I said, for 30 minutes on end. All I'm asking, keep it in prayer. I realize we might have years to go. I do. Me and John have talked about it many times. And, but yet there's always a side of me going, oh, but what if we don't? If we don't, are we ready? Are we ready for what's coming? All right. Now it's time for a message. Thank you for sharing. Amen. Thank you for acknowledging that. The title of this message is simply Images of Shavuot. Though I have a teaching on the prophetic significance of Shavuot, I keep finding more and more pointers to Shavuot in Revelation. And yes, I'm going to talk about Revelation. Can you believe it? Steve's going to talk about Revelation? <laughs> Shavuot is the marriage covenant in Acts 19 through 24. All right. I'm not going to read all these verses, but I'll refer to them so you can take notes if you wish. Again, it's the marriage covenant. In Exodus 19 and 24. Then we have it as the promised Holy Spirit as a guarantee of what's to come in Exodus 2. In Revelation chapter 19, we see the marriage take place in Revelation. So we have a we have a, a wedding back in Exodus. Then we have the promise of what's to come in Acts chapter 2 on Shavuot. And then we see in Revelation 19 a wedding taking place. However, as I mentioned last year, with the parable of the ten virgins, there's something that has always bothered me. And to this day, I still don't think I get it, but I'm going to present something today that might have a clue. And that is, when the ten virgins are waiting for the bridegroom, the bridegroom doesn't come on the expected day. He just, he misses the wedding day. Have you ever thought of that? They know what day it is. And he missed it. They all fell asleep. Okay, so the parable implies it's a day. Though. Now, I know when it comes to parables, well, a day can be in a month. It can be in a week. It can be in a year. And I get it. That's something we need to, you know, watch and pray to find out. But Yeshua brought that point out. I believe in the parable on purpose. He won't arrive on the given wedding day. As odd as that sounds, I'm just going to throw it out there for us to pray. I'm not saying, let's say the Lord. Please keep that in mind. Amen? Amen. If ever, by the way, if ever I say, thus saith the Lord, you can know I had to experience something from the Father directly. Now, 
That would mean I would have to see an angel. Now he knows that I can't handle that because I would put my pants if I saw an angel. So the odds of me ever saying that are like null and void. So just letting you know right now. I just, I want to see an angel, but man, I think I really would be scared to death. I mean, dude. Okay. So, he especially made that point about them, him missing his wedding day. But now my question is this, why? It doesn't make sense to me that he would miss his own wedding day. I mean, I know when Yahweh made the covenant with Abraham. Now, if you can read, if you can study this in uh, Genesis chapter 14 and 15. Real quick. In Genesis 14 and 15, this is where we see Lot get captured, okay? And then Abraham saves the day. Abraham goes out and saves him. The next day, now it's at nighttime, it says they went out at night, okay? Then, the next day, you see Melchizedek, all the, all the controversy on Melchizedek, okay? Not going there today. Everyone says amen. Now, so, the whole point, though, is on the first day of unleavened bread was when he met with Melchizedek. Thus, when he saves Lot the night before, it was Passover. All right? And then it was during the day when Yahweh says, look up and count the stars if you can. Who can count stars in the day? Nobody. The, the, the whole conversation continues. Again, it's in Genesis 14 and 15. The whole conversation continues. But then we see the covenant. It says, let me read real quick. Genesis 15, verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. The pieces that Abraham cut. And then it says, so he waited until nighttime. And then it says, on that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. It talks about the land being given. So he waited for the next day. Sunset had gone. He said, the night had fallen. On that day, he made the covenant. So the covenant with Abraham happened on the second day of unleavened bread. Well, why does that make any difference? If you go 430 years to the day, is when you see Moses noting that it was 430 years to the day when they were delivered out of Egypt. When were they delivered out of Egypt? First day of unleavened bread. So the covenant was made on the second day. You go 430 years to the day, you land on the first day of unleavened bread. So there was a purpose. For him making the covenant on the second day. Amen? Now I can see the imagery happening for, you know, that something would be like the day after Shavuot. Thus, he waited until nighttime, because the virgins were sleeping, and then he comes. Okay, I can see that, but my question is why? I'm not grabbing the understanding of why that imagery could be there for this element. If we were read Isaiah 24. Isaiah chapter 24 is all about a great massive earthquake taking place all over the world. Right smack in the middle of it, verses 14 through 17, Isaiah stops talking about the massive earthquake and he says this. Listen. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. From the west they acclaim Yahweh's majesty. Therefore, the east give glory to Yahweh. Exalt the name of Yahweh. Remember, this is the midst of talking about this massive devastation of an earthquake. And then it says, Exalt the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, in the lands and the islands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear seen glory to the righteous one. Then Isaiah says this, But I waste, but I said, I waste away, I waste away. Woe to me, the treacherous betray. With treachery, the treacherous betray. Terror and pit, terror and pit and snare away, you old people of the earth. So, He's getting this vision of all this massive devastation. But suddenly, in the midst of it, he sees and hears these people giving praise to Yahweh. Now, my question is, so is he seeing this, and then all of a sudden the devastation comes? Or is it going to be taking place the same day? I don't know. I do know from chapter, uh, the first seven, it implies it's the spring slash summertime. Why do I say that? Verse seven says, the new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers Chrome. When does the new wine come out? Spring. Summer. That's when the new wine is being poured out. Everyone's having a good time with it. So it's an implied, it's the spring, early summer time frame. Now that being said, we have images of Shavuot in Revelation. 
Images of Shavuot in Revelation. Now, before we go there, I want to go over a few things that you know, but I want to refresh our minds with. Noah came out of the ark when? 27th day, second month. 27th day of the second month. Then we know, and that's Genesis 8.20. Genesis 9.12, it tells us that he made a, uh, an altar and he made a, he ended up making a covenant. All right? So he, he gets out of the ark, 27th day. Somewhere immediately after that, he builds an altar, makes sacrifices, and there was a covenant made with Yahweh. All right? Now, with that covenant, we know what? The sign of the covenant was the rainbow. The sign of the covenant was the rainbow. Now, I believe with all my heart, because it was the 27th day of that month, we're only one week away from Shavuot. So it's very possible, not saying that's the same Lord, but very possible, the covenant that Yahweh made with Noah was on Shavuot. Now, that being said, we know coming out of Egypt, Shavuot took place on the fourth, uh, fourth day of the third month. Now, it was the third day that we see Yahweh come down in the cloud. Yahweh comes down in the cloud. He even told Moses this, Exodus 19.9. Yahweh said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told Yahweh what the, pe the people would have said. Now, so he comes down in the cloud. Does that sound familiar? Because it should. Yeshua said that he will come back what? In the clouds. First Thessalonians 4 discusses it. Acts chapter 1. The angels even said that the cloud had closed around him and took him up. And the angel says, what are you looking at the clouds for? So it's going to come back in the same way. See the imagery? Alright. Now, so those two events behind us. I want to read some verses. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah. Am I talking too fast? What? Can you hear me? Yes. Can anything else ask? Okay, moving on. So those two events, the flood and Mount Sinai, two events that gave us cloud being shrouded and a rainbow. That being in the back of our heads, please allow me to, hear, to read. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read a lot of reading now, so stay tuned, stay focused. And don't, I hope I won't lose you. Because i got to read a, a, a small paragraph to lead into where I'm going. Revelation 5.1 Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. It was a scroll. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. In that, I want to bring up. Lion of the tribe of Judah in the scroll. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Now I'm going to jump into Revelation chapter 10. Now it's going to start getting good. Here we go. It's about time. Revelation 10. Then I saw another, oh, by the way. What does the word angel mean? Thank you, messenger. Revelation 10 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. Stop. We just talked about being clothed in a cloud, coming down from heaven, and what else? A rainbow. Both images of Shavuot. <laughs> You're supposed to say it. Oh, that's any good. I'm to say it. Okay. Rainbow rub above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were fiery colors. He was only a little scroll that lay open in his hand. What do we see back in chapter 5? A scroll with seven seals. But now it's open. You say, Steve, that can't be a Hold on. 
He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. The lion of Judah. Are you with me? When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Why? Have you ever wanted to know what they said? I mean, I just, I just, why say it? They can't write it down. Moving on. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land, the land raised his right hand to heaven. Verse 6. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel was about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So, there's very good reason. And knowing that the that the, the marriage takes place in Revelation 19, there's reason to see Shavuot really could be all tied in when it all shakes down. Are you with me? Now, the seals are broken. The angels are pro prohibited from doing anything until the 144,000 are sealed. Did you know that? Even though the seals are broken, the angels are prohibited to doing anything until the 144,000 are sealed. Listen, this is Revelation chapter 7. Then I saw another angel. This is right after the sixth seal. The sixth seal had just been broken, and, and it flows right into verse 7. But please remember, a lot of times we get this different chapter, different thought process going? Stop that. Okay, yes, it applies sometimes. I get it. But remember, it's not always the case. When you, Especially when you see a storyline being written, don't stop at a chapter. Keep reading. Someone say amen. amen. Revelation chapter 7 verse 2 says, Then I saw another angel come out from the, from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Verse 3, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. The marriage covenant. Now, I believe, now what's that seal? I think it could be the marriage covenant. I can't prove it. I'm open to it. This is what I want to say something to here. Some thoughts have been going over my head that I've never thought of before. So I'm not saying they're right. But when I think of Matthew 7, 23, you know this verse, ready? It says, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Which also means workers of lawlessness. But he says, I never knew you. Knew you. As I was pondering that this last week, whenever you have in the Old Testament, a man and a woman come together. It says, and he knew her. At once, I thought, well, that's just a King James version. So I went to ESV and all the other versions. I, looked, I went straight to the Hebrew. It says Yada, which means to know. He knew her. All right? So there's an element. So whenever I hear Yeshua saying, I never knew you. There's, there's this is bridal talk. Are you with me? Yes. Now, why is that important? Because of what I'm about to read to you right now. Numbers chapter 30, verse 6. If she marries a husband while under her vows, or any thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she has bound herself, and her husband hears of it and says nothing to her on the day of, that he hears, then her vows shall stand. And her pledges by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if on the day that her husband comes to hear of it, he opposes her, 
Then he makes void her vow that was on her and the thought, thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she bound herself, and Yahweh will forgive her. So the husband has the authority to negate anything and everything that wife has ever done. The second he hears of it, no, nope, voided it. You're not under that contract anymore. See the importance of the marriage. When Yeshua says, I never knew you, there's more to it, I think, than what we have been thought of thinking about thus far. Does that make sense? Are you with me? As noted before, I can see the imagery of it happening the day after Shavuot, by way of the covenant of Abraham, on the second day of another bread. But I'm not understanding the purpose. And again, it may be longer than a day, I get it, as far as how long with the parable and being implied. However, there's a possible parallel with Shavuot. Let me give it to you. And actually, okay, let me ask you this, real quick. When did the fire and the, and the cloud all come down on the Mount Sinai? Was it on the day of Shavuot or the day before Shavuot? I don't want to answer he's going to say it. It happened on the day before Shavuot. The day of Shavuot was when Moab, you got it written down here, it's Exodus 24, verse 9. So Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and all the, his sons, and the 70 leaders, they went up to the mountain and they ate with Yahweh. That was the day of Shavuot. The day before Shavuot was basically the engagement. It's where the, the fire comes down, mountain, it's all clouded, and then all of a sudden they said, We will do what you say. We will. The engagement. The next morning, it says, uh, uh, on the first, but it says, Moses rose early the next morning, and it says he started building the altar, he had 12 pillars erected up for the 12 tribes, and that's when they went on the mountain. And no one did he actually he spread the blood over them, so this is the, the, the blood of the covenant. So that happened, happened on that day, on Shavuot, and then early the next morning. But the day before was when the fire fell down. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we see and read where the fire of tongues comes down on who? On all of them, right then, on the day of Shavuot. Which I believe, could be wrong, is all imagery of the fire coming down on the mountain. But, it came down on the mountain the day before, not the day of. Thus, I'm throwing it out there for us to ponder and pray about. I really think Shavuot in Acts chapter 2 is, in, is symbolic of the day before Shavuot in Exodus chapter 19 through 24. You say, see, why? Because in Exodus 19 through 24, the day before, that's the engagement. That's them saying, we will follow. And folks, right now, I don't know where you stand on this view, but I'm waiting for the new covenant. We are not in the new covenant yet. The new covenant comes with the marriage, okay? Thus, we are in the engagement process at the time. We're saying, we will follow. And we have to prove ourselves faithful in that walk until the time of the marriage comes. Are you with me? Now, if that's the case, and the day of Shavuot in Acts chapter 2, the promise of what's to come, was all symbolic of us being engaged, then it would be a parallel back to Abraham the day after when the actual marriage itself could take place. Thus, the parable Yeshua gave, they were waiting for the day of, but then it was that night, next night, when he actually came. So, all I'm saying is this. I think there's good reason for us to be open to looking at the day after Shavuot when things could get interesting. Now, am I saying to save the Lord? As I said, no. However, I believe there's similarities in things that I watch for. And I get excited when I see pieces of the puzzle that kind of fall together and you don't have to force them, you know what I'm saying? And the interesting thing is, I want to close out with this. I think I'm closing. In Revelation 12, it says, 
don't do anything. I'm sorry, that's Revelation, Revelation 7. It says, don't do anything until the 12,000 the 12, from each 12 tribes are sealed. Okay. Well, what do we see on the day of Shavuot back in Exodus? Again, he erected the 12, trump, the 12 pillars for the 12 tribes. Symbolic of what we see, the 12 tribes being sealed in Revelation chapter 7. So can Shavuot represent the sealing of the bride and then things begin immediately after? Thus, explaining why Yeshua says the bridegroom doesn't come on the day expected, but the day after. I don't know. However, I would like to say, I believe this is the time we should be watching and praying. I want to say that again. This is a time we should be watching and praying. Amen. More than ever before, the days, folks, that we are living in, this morning when I got, when I got that phone call, it shook me. And I'm thinking, Father, where are we at? I mean, I get it, and I mean it with all my heart. We may have years. But what if we don't? I was talking, and as I was talking to him, if you, this guy is such a humble guy. And to hear the things he was saying, he goes, I don't know if I'm right. I got, I, I got to repent of this, I got to repent of that. And I'm going, you? <laughs> He's such a cool guy. And, and I'm thinking, Father, where are we at in our walk? Just because we keep the feast, just because we keep the Sabbath, it doesn't mean our heart is right with him. Someone say amen, please. Amen. Our heart has to be right. Amen. You can go through the motion, but dude, if your heart isn't there, he doesn't want you. He wants someone who wants him to want to want him. That's what he's looking for. I'll shut up. and pray and make sure our heart is right. Just because we're here doesn't mean we're right. Just because you're doing this, that, and the other for Him doesn't mean you're right. You can be doing lots of things in His name. Man, you go back to where I mentioned in Matthew 20, God, chapter 7, those people who heard, depart from me and never knew you, said, I did this in your name. We did this in your name. We did this for you. I never knew you. Father, we love you and we praise you. And Father, I am so thankful <laughs> to be here with your people, let alone, Father, to be able to, to talk. Father, I pray that you will help us all to enjoy this day of what it truly represents and means. And Father, we're all so thankful for it. Help us to live our life how you want us to do, to be, to act, to think. Father, the mind is the battlefield and we have got to control it. Help us, Father, to obey you, to please you. To not want to even be seen by people to, because of what we do. But, Father, to only be seen by you. That's our prayer. To worship you and to serve you and to live our life wholeheartedly for you, regardless of what's ahead. If we have years or if we have only days. Regardless, Father, help us to be in line with you and your will all the time. In Yeshua's holy name. And everyone agree by saying? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much.